Um, I think there is um, three significant points in our life. The first one, um, it's you know, fairly obvious, it's the one where we take our first breath, right? That's a significant moment in our life journey, is when we enter the world and here we are. I think the other one is also significant, it's, it's at the other end of the scale. We don't like talking about that one too much, but um, unfortunately, I'm going to mention, it is a reality for us all. We will take our last breath. They are two significant moments in our life journey, right? Uh, I think the other one, and I think there's so many people in this room who would go, another significant life uh, point in my life's journey was when I met Jesus. When I intersected Jesus and I put my faith and my trust in him, that's a significant life moment for so many of us in this room this morning. And, and perhaps that's not you, and that's okay. Um, please feel welcome. Uh, and maybe, maybe there's a moment like that coming for you. But, but, but my question today is from that moment when you put your trust and your faith and your belief in Jesus to the point where you take your last breath, what's the point? What are we here for? And I think it's more than just being good, doing the right things and keeping our noses clean. Nah, it's not very profound, right? It's not very significant. I think there's such a much deeper point and purpose and I think it's being ca captured in the theme that we've got for this year. It's actually, the theme for the year is the kingdom is and I think that's the point from our belief in Jesus to when we take our last breath is to actually bring the kingdom of God on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's got some substance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got some meat. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is not just a futuristic one day heavenly type thing. It's actually to affect here right now. And our job, our call is to actually bring the kingdom of God into current reality, this place we call planet Earth. And I love actually reflecting on the Genesis story because I think it outlines and it sort of sets the trajectory for, for humanity, for us and our place in God's design. And so God creates and God forms us humans, people in his likeness, in his image. And he breathes his life into us. And then he gives us a grand purpose, his grand design. Um, Pastor Chris refers to it as the grand ethic. I'll put you on earth and I want you to cause this world that you call home to flourish. That's his grand design. And I need to find where I am on my notes. And the point from us believing in Jesus Christ to when we take our last breath is to join him in that story of causing the world to flourish. And his design is that we are made in his image, his likeness, to be his representatives, his reflection on planet Earth. That's a big call, right? And so today I just want to join the theme, the kingdom is, where we've heard about the kingdom is abundant, the kingdom is life. The kingdom is generous. The kingdom is not always easy. Uh, and you can flick through a whole long list of the kingdom is sermons if you want to access it online. But it's to form and to shape how we think about life and how we live our life. And this morning I want to add to that by preaching on the kingdom is transformation. And so let's read from Mark. Mark chapter 10, and this story would be a little bit familiar to some of us, but I want to draw some different things out of it today. As Jesus started on his way, a man came running up to him. Kneeling down in front of him, he cried out, good teacher, what one thing am I required to do to gain eternal life? If we've grown up in church, you would probably put that phrase eternal life into what do I need to do to get to heaven? But we've been unpacking that thought across the last few years and actually eternal life is not a futuristic reality, a future uh, life that we can look forward to, although it is. It's actually eternal life is life lived now to the full. 
And so the question from this young man isn't, how do I get to heaven? He's asking, how do I live life in this current reality, in my time and space, how do I live life to the full? And if we don't get that question right, we'll miss the point of the story. And Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. You already know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, don't cheat, and honour your parents. And again, if we are thinking the question is, what do I have to do to get eternal life, which is i.e. heaven, Jesus actually, his response is, well, you just got to do all the commandments and do enough good and you'll get there. And we know that that's not actually true. We, uh, we begin our journey by placing our faith and trust in Jesus. That's how we enter into eternal life, which is now and into the future. He's not saying do enough good things and you'll get future eternal life. He's actually giving us a different answer. He actually answers the, this young man with, if you want fullness of life, then obey the commands. And to Jewish understanding, that was actually the answer that he probably expected. If you want fullness of life, actually obey the commandments because it is the path of life. Following Jesus' rules, his commandments is the path of life. And so the rich young ruler responds back to Jesus and he says, Jesus, teacher, I have carefully obeyed these laws since my youth. I've kept the commandments. I'm on the path of life. I've done all that, was his response. In verse 21, I think there's a moment of pause. There's this pause where Jesus, I think perhaps, alters his, I think maybe body language, and he turns... And he makes eye contact. There's this feeling in scripture where there's this moment where Jesus is going to give a heart response to this young man. And it's caught in scripture here by Mark when he says, Jesus fixed his gaze upon the man with tender love. He actually stops and he goes, mate, I've got, I've got something more to say here, but I just need you to know that everything I'm about to say comes from this place of you want to know the path of life, I'm going to tell you in love how to get there. And that's so critical to this point in the story because the answer is a bit of ouch. It's a little bit of in your face. But it's so important for us to know that the heart of Jesus as he gives this answer is actually from a place of tender love. And he says to him, there is still one thing in you lacking. Go sell all that you have and give the money to the poor. Then all your treasure will be in heaven. After you've done this, come back and follow me. Completely shocked by Jesus' answer, he turned and walked away very sad, for he was extremely rich. For many of us, we would remember that this story is called for that reason, the rich young ruler. And Jesus then turns him, his, his gaze somewhere else and he looks at the faces of his disciples and he says to them this, how hard is it for the, well, for the wealthy to enter into God's kingdom realm? The disciples were startled when they heard this. But Jesus again said to them, children, it's next to impossible for those who trust in their riches to find their way into God's kingdom. He answers to this young rich young ruler, this wealthy man, not something so much about wealth. Uh, he's not anti-wealth, he's not anti-riches, but he actually says, if you want fullness of life, I want to tell you out of love. And I actually sort of, because I'm Aussie, I sort of picture the response, paraphrased by Jesus to be this. Mate, you've kept all the rules. Well done. If you want fullness of life, if you want real, gritty, fulfilling life, it means going beyond the rules to be transformed on the inside. And for you, 
That means no longer trusting in your wealth, but living with an open hand, giving generously, like our Heavenly Father does every single day. The story there of the rich young ruler is not about his riches, it's actually a story of transformation. And the point of believing in Jesus Christ to our last breath is a call, is the kingdom of God to be living, to be transformed into being Christ-like. A life that looks like Jesus. And as I mentioned before, that was the beginning of, of the creation story of humanity. We're made... We're created in his image, in his likeness. He's formed us to be his representatives, to be a reflection of him on planet Earth to cause the world to flourish. That was the original intent for us, to be like him, to be a reflection of him on planet Earth. And if we follow the Genesis story, well, that went badly. That went pretty badly. When God creates humans, puts them in the garden, and they went, you know what, the path of life that you've got, I reckon we can find our own. And they begin to not cause the world to flourish. That story progresses really fast of a world not flourishing and not a reflection of who God is. But if I'm honest with you this morning, I don't think I do any better, really. There is considerable daylight between Jesus and me being a reflection of him. I'm incredibly aware of my lack in that space. If you held up a light to my attitudes, you'd find some pretty stinking attitudes. If you measured my love for other people compared to the incredible love of God himself, I barely rate on that measuring stick. If you held up a mirror to me of mirroring God's reflection to the earth compared to, sorry, God's forgiveness to the earth, compared to his forgiveness, I would be an ugly reflection at best. Compared to how I hold on to what I think is mine, because after all, I, I got it. Compared to his generous, open-handed generosity to all of us, that comparison gets embarrassing. And if we would just take those four things, if I just take those four things, my attitude, my love, my forgiveness and my generosity, and compare that in terms of my reflection of Jesus on earth and who God is, that's a pretty poor reflection. But I'm not alone. But I'm not alone. Because I think you too, if you held up those four things and you just did a brief reflection on your attitudes, your love, your forgiveness and your generosity, I think we're all acutely aware of how poor a reflection we are of Jesus Christ on planet Earth. We are far from perfect. Anyway, be blessed. Have a great week. Um, <laughs> hope that really ministered to you. If the story ended there, we're all in misery, right? But thankfully, mercifully, God is not after a perfect reflection. He is not after perfection. There is a deep breath. Whew. He is not after perfection. Because if he was the story would look something like this. If we live with the belief that God expects perfection and we live in this knowledge that I'm so imperfect, it must lead to guilt and shame and condemnation. It has to. God is so incredibly good, so perfect, and I am not, leads to this path of guilt, shame, and condemnation. And they become oppressively powerful in lives where we feel distant, separated from God, that he wants nothing to do 
with us. I'm forever doomed to failing. I will never reach perfection. And God will only accept me if I can do enough good. And so what's the response to that? Double your efforts. Not in becoming like Jesus, but in rule keeping and box ticking. And that is tiring, but it's oh so necessary because I just have to keep doing enough good to be perfect. And that treadmill of perfection in the hopes that we will be enough, but internally knowing we can never do is just simply a vicious cycle. And we're left with two options. Let's chuck it all in. I don't care anymore. I can't do that. You know what? The path of life, I'm going to find my own path of life. And we think we're chasing freedom. But we end up in this place where actually it's not freedom at all and it leaves a bitter taste in our life. Or we trick ourselves into believing that I've done enough good, that I've done all the right things that God needed me to do. And if we can just do it long enough to cross this imaginary finish line of perfection, then we end up with this, a sense of pride and self-righteousness. I've done enough and I'm now worthwhile, and worse than that, we then use ourselves as the measuring stick of how others are supposed to behave. And that brings judgment and self-promotion. I'm better than you. It's a special kind of lie, but at least it makes us feel better about ourselves. Thankfully, God is not after perfection. And that storyline will never lead us out of our awareness of our imperfections and our failings of being a poor reflection of Jesus Christ. So what's the way out? That's the question you want answered, right? What's the way out? If it's not perfection, what is the way out of this sense of I'm not making the perfect standard that God needs me to make? Jesus' response gives us a clue to this young man. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one, there's only one, there's only one that is good. And as my mate Preston says, all I have, all I have is the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. You want to know the way out? That is the way out. There is only one that is good, which is why his standard for you is not perfection. Only he is good. And all I have is the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I won't ever register as good enough or perfect enough, having done enough, having kept enough rules, or even come close to being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And yet, and yet, the one who is good still welcomes me, invites me in, includes me, shows me this incredible love and mercy. And I bet you there's a few people sitting here today that know that story, that you know that you are acutely imperfect. You fail on a regular basis. You are a poor reflection of Jesus Christ. And yet, you know you are still welcomed in by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. It's a good story, right? It's the way out of our misery. So I want to take a moment, just a moment. And I think this is a really good habit and a really good practice for us, is to focus in on that story, the story of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. One of my favourite illustrations of that was actually a couple of weeks ago when we baptised a few people in our church community. And I love it. I love it because they come up on stage during the worship time and they tell the story of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ in their life. And I love it because we hear the story, but we're all sitting in our seats and we're going, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, that's your grace and mercy in that person's life. And we celebrate it. We don't actually sort of cheer and scream and yell and get excited, but I was on the inside. I don't know about you, but that moment, I'm just celebrating and I'm focusing in on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And one of those people said this, even when I was at my worst, God was still there. That is the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. God shows up in our mess 
and he doesn't stop turning up in our mess. And some of you know that story. And you almost went to the point of guilt and shame and condemnation. It's there, it's so close. But actually refocusing in on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ that he shows up in our mess and he continues to show up in our mess that God is faithful, that he doesn't quit even when we give him a reason to quit. The grace and mercy of Jesus is actually the air in our lungs and the sun that came up today. I, I like the simple thoughts in life. And that one means something to me because I reflect on God's mercy and go, my very existence today is only because of him. I have breath in my lungs and the sun rose not by accident but because of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Today is the miracle of his mercy and grace in our lives. Focus in on that. That his mercy, Scripture tells us, are new every morning and that his loving kindness is forever. That is his grace and mercy. His mercy hasn't run out for you because it can't run out for you. That the greatest demonstration of God's love and kindness and mercy and grace was Jesus on the cross. And that we know that despite all our imperfections, all our sin, all our mess, our lack of gratitude, our lack of honour, our lack of worship, the times when we choose to go our own path of life to do our own thing, even in rejection of what we know to already be true, he continues to follow us. He's willing us to choose life because he is far kinder than we think. I love that phrase introduced to us by Shane Willard. God is far kinder than we think. And his mercy and grace is extended to you today. And as we journey on this path of transformation, we shift our attention from being self-focused, which is just a black hole of shame and guilt and condemnation, knowing my incredible lack. We shift our focus to this Grace and mercy of Jesus, where there's life and light. And that begins the transformation journey. His mercy and his grace, his kindness is the catalyst for transformation. Romans 2, 4 says this, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Repentance is just turning away from I'm walking my own path of life to I'm going to walk your path of life. And it's not guilt and shame and condemnation. That'll never actually change us into a path of life. It's actually that his goodness, his mercy transforms us. How could we ever be transformed into representing Jesus well on earth if we focus on our failings? We look, we see, we take time to meditate, to consider, to chew on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, and we are changed from the inside out. When I focus on his grace, I become more gracious. When I focus on his love, my attitudes to others have to become more loving. When I see his incredible patience for me that he doesn't quit on me, I extend God's patience to others. When I look at his continual forgiveness and I receive it as my own, then I can't help but offer forgiveness to those who have wronged me. When I see that he is actually the owner and the author of it all, I have to live with an open hand of generosity. When I see that he is the one who created everything, I see that I'm, I'm just a really, really, really small part in his story. And I live with not a sense of self-importance, but of humility and not putting myself in front of others. The way out of the story, the way to being transformed into his likeness is actually to shift our focus onto his grace, not just see our lack. And as we do this, it leads us into the journey of transformation. I just got two really quick points. I'm not going to elaborate them long, but just to finish off today. But I actually think they're really critical points for us to understand that this transformation is a journey. 
And for Dave out the back, I switched my last two points around. So if we can go to the last screen. I think we, I think we have this belief wrapped up in the perfection that my transformation into becoming like Jesus is a moment, is an instantaneous process. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. But we know it's not. But we think it is, but we know it's not. And because we believe, part of us believes that truth, then we end up in the guilt and shame of, oh, I'm not like Jesus and I've been with him for 40 years on the road following Jesus and I'm still an average to poor reflection of him because we're treating it as it's supposed to be a moment, an instant where we are just magically transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And I would like that to be the story, but it's not. The story of transformation is that it is a journey. It is a lifelong process. It is formation. It is cultivated as I choose to follow in the path of life. It's an ongoing journey of transformation into His likeness. And the second thought with that is that it's actually not about perfection. It's about willingness. It's about willingness. I love Romans 12 verse 1 and uh, there'd be a bunch of versions that some of you are familiar with. Weirdly, Romans 12 verse 1 follows the first 11 chapters. And the first 11 chapters are about the grace and mercy of Jesus. The author just takes all this time to unpack the grace and mercy. And then chapter 12 in the Passion Version starts with this question. What should be our proper response to the marvellous mercy of who God is? His incredible kindness. To surrender yourselves to God to be His sacred living sacrifice. The word willingness is not mentioned there, but it's so implied in surrender and sacrifice. The journey of transformation is all about your willingness, not your perfection. Thank God for that. And so this morning... I just want to encourage some people here that you've been on the journey with Jesus for a long time and maybe you're sitting in your seat and you're going, I am such a poor reflection of Jesus. That is the voice of condemnation and I'd love to take that from you because God never needed you to be perfect even after decades of following him. What he needs is your willingness. And there's a verse in Galatians chapter 6 that says this, don't, weary, don't grow weary, don't grow weary, don't grow weary in doing good because there is a reward of life. And for those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time and on that journey, man, there's some hits, there's some road bumps, there's some hurts, there's some disappointments. I want to encourage you this morning, continue on in being willing to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ because that was God's original intent for your life. Don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. And I want to challenge you, if there's a sense of, I need to do something with this, it's not condemnation, it's conviction. And the conviction of God is an old school word that we don't use much anymore, but we used to have a very negative connotation on it. The conviction is what Jesus did to that young man. And he turned his gaze to you and he says, don't grow weary. There's a path of life. I'm willing you to choose it. You just need to be willing to continue to be transformed into his likeness, no matter how long you've been on the journey. And if that's you, I'm just, I'm just prompting the thought and I'm gonna leave that response to you. And there could be some people in this room this morning who you know you know those two moments I was referring to, you were born and there will be the final day. But there's a moment where you intersect Jesus and you might be sitting here this morning, you're like, no, nah, I've never done that. And maybe you've been on this journey of life and you thought what you, what you believed was gonna be life-giving has actually ended up being empty and hollow. That there's just something missing. I wanna tell you, 
My life story is when I intersected Jesus, that journey of life has been worth playing for, has been worth continuing on, even through some of the hurts and pains and discouragement. And I want to give you a moment to respond in a minute. Just to say, I want to start the journey with Jesus and enter into his story for planet Earth. So church, you know how we do this. Could we stand? And I'm I'm going to invite you, if that's you, just in a moment, just to respond, not by coming out the front, but just by raising your hand and say, I want to begin that journey with Jesus today. I'm going to trust, put my faith in him. So church, would we just respect that moment by just bowing our heads and closing our eyes? And if that's you, I just want to start my journey with Jesus. I want to enter into the path of life. I want to believe in Jesus and trust his story. Would you just raise your hand today? Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Thank you. Fantastic. There's another one. There's three. Is there any more this morning? Thank you, man. Thank you. There's another. Thank you. I see that hand there. That's five. That's five. We're willing to go on this path of life with Jesus. I'm just not going to prolong this for much longer. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else that wants to join in that? Thank you. So I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, for those people today who are willing, willing to enter your story, would you just come and meet them where they are at? God, thank you for your life becoming alive in them and bringing a new path, a new day, a transformation of their old story into something new. God, We bless you for their work, your work in their lives. Church, why don't we just celebrate those people who've responded today. That's fantastic. And thank you. That is me.